Right, so um, welcome, thanks, thanks for coming along. Uh, my name's Carl Adams and I'm going to talk with you, I know that. Um, so I'm from, I went to school in Margate and in Birchington and uh, had, a, had a really good childhood. Loved the county. I come from a family of uh, publicans and bookmakers, so I uh, didn't have much of a chance really. <laughs> So I went from the age of, actually from the age of 16 to 18, I did a carpentry apprenticeship, but I was quickly sucked into the pub life. And I ended up running pubs, restaurants and hotels for the next 10 years. So from 18 to 28, I did that. But at the age of 26, I actually made the decision that 10 years would be enough. I was really enjoying it. But I was, I don't know if you can be a practical alcoholic. I was an alcoholic, <laughs> or I am an alcoholic, but in recovery. Girlfriend, now wife, but we were, we'd only been together a couple of years, and we thought if we can buy a round the world ticket and spend 24 hours a day together for a year, then we might try and settle down together. <laughs> so um, we went off and did that. It ended up being two years. We got stuck in Africa, like willingly stuck in Africa, not hijacked or anything. And um, while I was out in Africa and we were travelling around, I was uh, fascinated by the difference in how countries can be so different. And the, the prime example being Zimbabwe. So we spent some time in Zimbabwe. It was a, it was kind of a we didn't just arrive in Zimbabwe. That wasn't our first African experience. I would say thankfully, but that's not right because it is a beautiful country. But we started off on the easy, easy route in South Africa and then Namibia and Botswana. And then we ended up in Zimbabwe. <clears throat> but we couldn't really understand how travelling from Zimbabwe to Botswana could be so different. So in Zimbabwe there's abject poverty, you know, people living hand to mouth but really happy. And in Botswana there were supermarkets, people walking about in suits. And that just fascinated me, how could countries be so vastly different and it turns out it's the way the, um, the natural resources were managed in, in Botswana and how um, they discovered, if you like, or we thought we discovered as the West, the, um, the natural elements that could, could mean that that African nation, although there is still abject poverty in Botswana too, but that African nation could be relatively affluent compared to Zimbabwe. So I, while I was away and before we came home I applied to the uh, University of Kent to, to come and study international relations so, and politics. Not the boring kind of party politics side of it but the more exciting blood and guts really for want of a better phrase. War and peace and what I feel would be uh, an empathetic approach to the way I live my life. And and then I uh, was awarded a scholarship from the James Madison Foundation to, to study federalism here in Kent. And that uh, was a real honour for me. So I didn't go to university until I was 30. Studied for three years international relations and politics. Scholarship for federalism. And the, I won't bore you with the details, um, but I love the concept of federalism. And the, in its original form, which is 17th century, so actually what the principles of... Principles of principles of federalism are founded on is actually power starts with the family and then it's dispersed via different levels so it would be the village, the municipality and then the kingdom. But it's a concept of self-rule and shared rule and the original federal idea was actually termed a community of communities. So I got fascinated then with what community really meant. You know, community can mean a lot of different things to, you know, ask people which communities, or you guys, what communities you belong to. So you're a vegan, you're a vegan runner, but you, 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 that's not your only identity. You belong to probably loads of communities. So where you're from, you, you're the British community, the European community. And so I thought, well, how can I apply the, the concept of, of community to what I want to do? Because realising, you know, 34 at a time, becoming aware of my own mortality. Until that time, I was uh, living life as though it was going to go on forever. And so I got wind of a concept of, of uh, social enterprise. Um, do you all know what social enterprise is? I, I, I would give you a brief overview of what social enterprise is. So in this, it quite often gets lumped in the same category as, as charity. So you'll often hear of the not-for-profit sector. So charities are non-profit 
So Oxfam is a non-profit or Save the Children is a non-profit. A social enterprise actually exists to make as much money as possible so it can reinvest that money into a social goal. And I think what really needs to happen is that social enterprise needs to make an amicable divorce from the not-for-profit sector or the non-profit sector because it's a misnomer. Social enterprise really means conscious capitalism, have you heard that phrase? So making money, being a capitalist, but reinvesting a large proportion or as much of that money as possible into a social goal, into a social business. That's after people get paid you know, a decent wage because if we don't pay a decent wage, if we don't pay ourselves a decent wage, then we're going to get sucked into the corporate sector or other organisations that pay decent money. So, in my opinion, like, we don't pay teachers enough. You know, it's controversial. I don't think we pay MPs enough either, but we won't go down that line. <laughs> so, I um, got involved in social enterprise. First of all, it was really on a small scale, and I cut my teeth by helping community shops. So, in rural communities, you'll go, if you're from Kent or you, know, you go to the countryside, you'll know now that quite often you'll see maybe one village hall, but that village 50, 100 years ago would have had a, a baker's, a greengrocer's, a pub, a post office, a shop. So I helped quite a few, seven community shops in, in Kent where it was going to be that this, this shop is going to close, we need to find some volunteers to, to save this or we need to sell community shares so people have a vested interest in, in their asset and then it's run as a, as a social venture. So I, I did that, really enjoyed it. And then the next level was community pubs with my background in, in pubs, that was quite handy. And so we saved pubs, we saved uh, post offices, and this is going back, blimey, it's almost 10 years now. And all of the, all of the shops, that, and I say we deliberately, because I was a very, I may have started, I instigated the project, but I was a very small cog in the wheel in the end, because it takes, like, it does take a community or a community of communities to save these businesses. So 10 years down the line, they're all still and then, I started um, looking at how I could improve my own fitness and I was, I was quite overweight, I was drinking way too much and I wasn't probably your uh, typical alcoholic, what you would call a stereotypical alcoholic, I was probably what you call a functioning alcoholic, you know, drinking four nights a week, turning up to work every day fine but not for, on the outside fine but internally full of anxiety and angst and, and uh, I started looking at um, for inspiration about how I could kind of change that, that behaviour and I'm sure, I'm absolutely sure that you guys are going to know these two books but this first book, so I googled um, fitness, middle age because I was approaching middle age uh, alcoholism and, and, and running. And this book came up, Eat and Run. Have you all seen it? Have you all read it? Yeah. So Scott Jurek uh, and the, the strap line or the, the subtitle is My Unlikely Journey to Ultramarathon Greatness. So this guy is a, is a complete inspiration. And I say inspiration uh, deliberately as opposed, and, and, I'll, and I'll come back to why inspiration might not be the only thing you need, but this guy is a complete inspiration. He's uh, one of the best ultra runners in the world, and it's all founded on a, on a vegan plant-based diet. <clears throat> so each chapter, at the end of each chapter, it goes through his childhood and, and uh, how he developed, and you know, he's brought up in Minnesota where pretty much everyone eats from the barbecue, and uh, when he, when he became a vegan, much, much less a, a vegan runner, people were like, yeah, okay, whatever. And it was really hard for him to become vegan, but he, he did it. And it wasn't just for the ethical, in actual fact, it wasn't, it wasn't for the ethical side of it at all. I'm not saying he didn't care about animals, but he lived in a, in a state where hunting was like ex not only acceptable, but encouraged, you know. So he was looking for an edge when it came to uh, running and, and Somebody mentioned to him that he should trial a vegan plant-based diet for 30 days and see how his uh, running improved. Now, at the time when I was reading this, I was doing probably 5K runs three times a week, the same road. I live in the countryside, uh, in a village called Smardham, which is about half an hour from here. 
only a thousand people live there. It's, the, it's like your chocolate box, idyllic village and footpaths everywhere, forests everywhere. And I was running on the road, this five, same 5k loop, and um, probably three times a week. I started venturing cross country and, and uh, then tried the, the, the vegan diet. And um, I just started feeling that I was getting stronger and stronger by the day, you know, and, and by the time the 30 days were up, I was running practically every day. As I've said before, I've got a very addictive personality. I can't do things by halves, it just doesn't happen. So if I'm gonna go vegan, plant-based, I've gotta go full in. You know, a lot of people talk about transitioning, so cut this out or cut that out. But I had to go full in with that, and, and then the running started moving up from 5K to 10K to, to half marathon. And I got to the marathon stage, and then, you know when you go onto Amazon, and you, they, they know your history about what you've bought. And I went, oh, my next book, I need to find my next book about um, running and veganism. And this one popped up, Finding Ultra. You all seen this? So Rich Roll, is, uh, he's, he's pretty big now. He's got a podcast with millions of downloads. It's a weekly podcast. But, I mean, the top of this is a subtitle. So the title is Finding Ultra, and the, top of, uh, the subtitle is Rejecting Middle Age, Becoming One of the World's Fittest Men, and Discovering Myself. So this guy, at the age of, I mean, obviously there's a long backstory. So he was a college swimmer. He was a, he was a very adept college swimmer, and he just missed out on the Olympics. He was that good, but soon got dragged into the kind of glamorous lifestyle um, and became a, a a lawyer actually. And all of the social life that revolves around that, being in, in a big city and going out for drinks at lunchtime and in the evening, he, he soon became an alcoholic. Um, actually gave up drinking at the age of 30, but replaced drinking with fast food. He, I think he called it the, um, like the window diet, so he would just get all of his food through the window, so fast food at the drive throughs And so, he, he got um, married, it was a farcical marriage, um, but you've got to read the book to find out about that. And he got remarried and four kids in the house, two from his, uh, his wife's previous marriage and, and two, two girls that he'd, he'd had in the last four to, uh, four to two years. So he was 39, he laying on the sofa and the following, he went to go up the stairs, quite a steep set of stairs in his house. He'd been watching TV all night, eating fast food, and he was going to be 40 the next day. Went up the stairs, started sweating, had heart palpitations, went to kiss his two-year-old daughter goodnight, and he broke down because he imagined her getting married, and he imagined her living her life, and he thought, I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to see her get married. She's two now. I'm 40 tomorrow. And that was it. He's got the same thing, like all or nothing, alcoholic attitude, channeled into a, into a good thing. So within a year, he starts running ultra marathons, but his wife had always been vegan, and she was banging the drum to him all the time, but he was just ignoring it. And uh, after that following morning, he says, well, I'm gonna cave in. And so she put him on a vegan plant-based diet. The guy ends up on the front of Men's Fitness Magazine, four years later, as one of the world's fittest men ranked in the top 25 at the age of 44. He's 51 now and he looks just as fit and he's, and he's absolutely smashing all of these long distance ultra endurance events. So with my background in social enterprise um, and inspired by Scott Jurek, but I say inspired because this one, I mean this guy is winning ultra marathons by like 30 minutes. 50 milers, 100 milers, even further, bad water, which is like a 135 mile run through Death Valley. 135 mile run through Death Valley. Like you're talking like 100 degree heat. He's winning those, right? So that is inspirational. This guy is aspirational, so meaning that you can read that. I read that and pretty much, well, we're not the same age, but the same story almost. And I'm th I can do that. I'm thinking, I. I I, if he can do that in his life, which pretty much mirrors the, the trajectory of my life with, with the drinking and the, and the alternative way of, of living and re-challenging that, two, 
two daughters, they've just walked in, they're over there, <laughs> and the son, but he's came, came recently. And <clears throat> I thought, well, how can, how can I um, make this my, because I loved running, but I had to work as well, how can I make this a, a vocation? So the guy who was training, I went to a guy and I was being trained for a hundred miler and he was putting me through my paces. He was pretty much anti-vegan, but um, do you know the ones that are, uh, it's like, how you won't, you just won't, you know, get the usual story about not being able to get enough protein or uh, the, you're, if you want to be an athlete, you, you, you just, you'll just wither away. And this was before some of the films that came out, like, like What the Health and From the Ground Up recently, have you seen that one? Um, and more and more athletes have turned to veganism just completely disproved that. So you've got David Hay, a heavyweight boxer, although he's lost a couple of fights, hasn't he? But not because of veganism, obviously. Jermaine Defoe and loads of players in the National Basketball League. And so he kept saying, hang on. And I was never really, really conscious not to preach to anyone about it. And I deliberately, whether this is right or wrong, I don't call, my, I don't call myself a vegan, although I do, but in with people that, that I'm trying to convert, if you like, I won't say I'm a vegan, I say I'm using a plant-based um, diet to aid my, my running and my recovery because actually it works. And some of the people that have tried it, they've turned around and said, oh, they don't, I hate that it works. I hate you, I hate you, it works. <laughs> um, and you've made a vegan out of me, you know? So when I was being trained by this guy, um, he was moaning to me about, he's been a personal trainer for 23, 24 years. He was moaning to me about <clears throat> being in the business that he's in. You know, he charges quite a lot for, the, for an hourly rate, it's about 80 quid for a personal trainer. So it can really only be affordable by people who've got money. And he was saying to me, oh God, these bloody middle class people, you know, they want to pay for a personal trainer, they want to go home and brag about having a personal trainer over dinner on a Saturday night. They're not listening to me. You know, they're, they're, not, they're not getting any fitter. You know, they might be, some of them are, but you know, it's just really frustrating. The people who really need my help can't afford it because they're priced out of the market. And at the time I was working with a social enterprise that was around woodwork and we were working with, I set it, set it up, and we were working with long-term addicts, so average uh, addiction was like 20 years, or ex-offenders, and their average time in prison was about five years. And they were coming to us. The ones that had been in prison were actually quite healthy. They were coming to us because, you know, they might have only had one focus while they were in prison. That would have been working out. And they were actually looking after themselves. But the long-term addicts, obviously for the nature of what they'd been doing for the X amount of years, were coming to us in, a, in an awful state. Really bad, and I mean not even eating at all, some of them. And if they, when they were eating, it was a microwavable meal and they were bringing that in. And I, so I was moaning to him about that. And then the light bulb went off. So we got to put these two things together. This was going back early part, sorry, latter part of 2015. <clears throat> and so we set up a, a social enterprise and let, why don't we try and make this our living? So we'll, we'll charge people the 80 pounds. We'll charge people who can afford it the right rate and we'll reinvest that money and we'll make it free for people who are in recovery and for homeless people. And so we went to the charity porch, right? If any of you are from Canterbury, or, or, or from Kent, the charity Porchlight do some amazing work. So they work with homeless people, but they make sure that they are housed, they're registered homeless, but they're put into, or they're staying in, put into, sounds a bit cruel, doesn't it? But they're, they're, uh, they're housed in, in a homeless hostel. And they do some really good stuff around activity. And obviously, everyone knows that if you, if you go into a darkened room and you sit there for all day then you're going to feel depressed. But if you go outside into the forest or just outside for a walk along the beach or even through the city with a group of friends you'll come back refreshed and revived. So they do a lot of that stuff. Um, but we quickly found, so we went to them with the idea and said this is what we want to do and they like, all practically snatched our hand off. And so we started running a few uh, taster sessions for people in recovery and for homeless people with Porchlight. 
and we went to um, GPs and we said to GPs, look, you are, you're referring these people to a gym, which is really good in principle. So someone in recovery or someone suffering with anxiety or depression, you don't have to be homeless, but you will quite often be prescribed a gym membership by the GP. It will be the gym referral. So, and they'll make it free, which is, you know, so the GP and the system, the NHS are thinking, what more can we do? This is like, we're making the gym in free, which is quite expensive, uh, to people who really need it. Now that's brilliant, but there's one problem. I don't know about you, but at the lowest point of your life, when you're really struggling, so you're struggling with addiction or homelessness and all the other things that come with those issues, can you think of a more intimidating place to go than a Ballantines or a, a David Lloyd leisure centre? So they've actually given these memberships. They go along, the gym's not getting the income, they're having their taster session, the two, two hours, so they get their, you know, when you join a gym you get your two hour kind of evaluation and then you get a programme to follow. And of course, they've got no kit, they've got no trainers, so they're turning up in like old tracksuit bottoms that they've borrowed, or t-shirts that are dirty or ripped, and, and they've seen all, all of these people there that are fit and healthy and well, and, or even if they're not, they've got the right kit and they're determined to make it. So of course, they never go back. The gym loves this. So the gym, the gym relies, so the big gyms, they rely on people not turning up. So you know in January, if you go to a gym in the first two weeks in January, everybody signed up. They've put in their, their year's membership and the gym knows if everyone who's joined that gym in January comes back, they'll be full to capacity and they won't be able to, to um, service the people that have joined that gym. So they actually rely on people not coming back. So come February and March, it's probably 50% maybe more, 70% of the people that joined up. By, by this time of year, May, there's probably 30% of the people that joined in, in um, January still going to the gym. And then by the end of the year, they might get... The Steve, who trained me and to, to run a couple of uh, 50 milers at first and then 100 milers. I ran with that gentleman over there. What, what, what did we do? It was a 50k, wasn't it? Yeah. Down on some fire high, yeah. And uh, so he was training me, but it's all, he, his ethos is about Get outside. There's no need to go to the gym. You, every woodland in this county is a gym. You know, and we're never far from woodland. And by woodland, he said, if there's two trees there, that's a woodland, yeah? So the White Cliffs of Dover, we'll go up there, or the North Downs, you know, beautiful Pilgrim's Way. We'll get up there, and we'll take these homeless dudes up there, and we'll get them thinking about what it means to be active, and, and we'll measure. We'll actually measure, like, how good they feel before they start or how bad they feel and we'll do it after the session and then after a couple of weeks, after six months and after a year. Uh, I'm back to show you a video of where, where we've got to with that uh, and we've probably got about a quarter of an hour left but what's happened is people who've come along with us and it's always free, I need to emphasise that, so we will charge people if you can afford it and there's varying degrees of affordability, so we make it as affordable as we can for people. If it's a corporate event, so yesterday we ran a, a corporate away day, team building away day, and so we charged them, it wasn't astronomical, but it was like £100 a person, and there were 20 people there, and we put on um, a woodland activity, we added equine therapy, which is something else we use, so horses, get people to, to work with horses and I know enough to be dangerous about horses right so a little knowledge is always dangerous but uh, from so we partner with as many organizations we can but there's an organization called Equine Therapy Kent who are completely against riding horses even put shoes on the horses feet they rescue horses and they, they love them and these horses are like the, the most they're healthy but they are spoiled rotten you know they've come from uh, a, a terrible background usually and so we, worked, we found this organisation and we thought it would be a brilliant partnership because of the, the kind of the connection between the story of those horses and the story of the people including myself and how you can, you can actually recover through, through love and affection and through the right food so they, these, these horses are, are eating the 
you know, I'll bet they're eating better than any horse at Ascot, you know. But, so we work with uh, equine therapy Kent and a forager as well. So the forager comes out into a woodland with us and the homeless people and shows them what you, have you, have everyone experienced forage, foraging? I mean, 400 plants in Kent we can eat, you know, and when he, when he first came along and we met him just in a, in a driveway at the equine therapy centre, this forager, he, Miles Irvin, he's written a great book, he lives in Charlton just down the road, and I just assumed that we'd have to go into the woods or the forest to find stuff, and we didn't even leave the car park, and like we were eating uh, practically a main salad, and he's pulling out thistles and stripping all the thistles off, and you know, uh, hawthorn and nettle, nettle soup, and, and, and uh, so the, we were blown away by that, and the homeless people are uh, just blown away by it, and uh, we can eat for free. Uh, we don't have to believe this uh, industrial food thing that we're all taught, and I know I'm preaching to the choir on that one, for sure, at this event. So, it's not just about what we're doing. By the way, our organisation, I should have <laughs> said, is called Primal Roots. So getting back to how we're meant to be, how we're meant to feel as human beings. That might go back to the dawn of time or might go back to our birth. You know, if you want to see the perfect way to run, for example, if you want to see the perfect form. So if you... Uh, I became a running coach recently through British Athletics uh, because of the journey that I've been on. And, and you get drummed into you the right technique. As runners, you'll know that... You know, you, there's certain ways that you can improve. And some of us have to work quite hard on that. You know, I run a bit lopsided, exaggerated. Um, but if you want to see a perfect running style, watch a, a t my two-year-old son, or any two-year-old. If they run from there to there, they'll, run, they'll land perfectly, they'll have the perfect stance. It's because that's how we're meant to move. And we've lost that. We've lost that ability through sitting, sitting down in an office all day, or behind the wheel of a car, or whatever and, and our hips, our hip flexors and our psoas muscles, they get so tight that people are hunched over. I'm, you know, I'm one of the worst. I'm just trying to improve all the time but, but eventually if that gets tight then that will end up like that and that's when you see people literally walking, walking a way that we're not designed to walk. So we build, that's why it's called primal roots, getting back to our primal roots and the roots as well being the food. So when I said to you about people coming along to the woodworking sessions that have not looked after themselves, when it, they started coming along to our fitness sessions, so we met at, we made the mistake, first of all, meeting at half twelve, because the portrait said that's the time when they're free. So we were meeting at half twelve and then going into the woods at one, coming back about three. And they were starting off all right, and then at three o'clock they were completely beat. I mean, even some of the guys that were relatively fit, so it soon became apparent that they had no breakfast and they were basically eating one meal a day and it was just rubbish. So we said, I'll tell you what, we'll meet at 10, we'll come along, we came with like, you know, like the protein energy balls with oats and cashew nuts and almonds and stuff. And you go into a hipster cafe in London, they'll sell you one at three quid, won't they? With your, with your four pound coffee. But they cost about 20p to make. So we were making them, fueling them with that and then making sure they were getting hydrated because a lot of them were dehydrated as well. <clears throat> and, and then getting food, healthy, vegan, plant-based food within them, in them within 30 minutes of the, of the session because there's that window of recovery. If you, get, you can fuel yourself within 30 minutes, you recover quicker and you'll be able to go again tomorrow. So that's really the story of, that's my story and the story of Primal Roots and I'll show you a film, it's going to last two or three minutes. Uh, we were lucky enough to, to recently win what's called the Kent Sport Kudos Award, so you know, about 50 entries, we got down to the final three and for the three finalists they made a, a short two minute film about what we were doing and then it went to a, a big conference and then all of the, it, the three films were showed and we took a load of homeless people with us and uh, the people in the audience voted for the winner. So we might have skewed it a little bit. <laughs> but, uh, so we won that award and this is the result, this is that film that was shown on that day. If I, is it, can, yeah, hopefully. Oh, okay. And um, I don't know. <laughs> 
trying to figure it out when um mm. there we go. Oh good. Hopefully it will work. There we go. There's a lot of scientific research and proof that when you move an exercise outside, your mood is enhanced immediately. Really push down, ground yourself into the earth. We do some meditation, do some mindfulness. We move around the floor like animals. Leave that leading leg. Good. We are doing something different. Touch head. And what I've discovered is people who start doing one thing different can start doing other things different in their lives. That's the equivalent of about 20, 30 reps on a shorter press. Our stuff with mental health, coming out here in the open and quiet, does wonders. Stay down, stay down. <laughs> it's part of a balanced life, which is what I need to have a happy life, basically. Now, for you to breathe in, we work with some great organisations in Kent who work with people trying to overcome addiction or experiencing homelessness or mental health. Okay. Yeah. I'm four months over next Monday and I've also lost two stones since being with Final Roots and I just feel fantastic. At the moment we have relied on grants from charitable organisations like the Big Lottery Fund but long term we will be charging the man on the street and eventually we want people who come through the primary sessions to actually lead those sessions as well. Oh, gentlemen, this is excellent. If we can spark something that means that people produce the amount of harm they're doing to themselves, then we can start to change the world. Thank you. 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 Thank some um, more investment. So we just became an approved supplier to Kent County Council. Uh, we've been banging the drum, or well, loads of organisations have been banging the drum about prevention rather than cure when it comes to um, mental health and, and, and addiction. Uh, because quite often we get people, you know, at least, at least in their 20s and, and a lot older. Uh, but what if we were to work with people at an earlier stage and try and prevent them going down that path in the first place. And it's a really hard thing to sell because how can you prove that you've stopped somebody going down that, down that road? You can't. It's impossible. But we've managed to persuade Kent County Council that um, we should or could help 14 to 24 year olds in, in the Folkestone area. Apparently there's um, some work to be done in Folkestone and Hythe with some young people who, they, they're not, they've not gone completely off the rails yet. They're, they're kind of toying with drugs and alcohol and, and may have gotten into some trouble. And so we're really proud. We used that film. We got to a Dragon's Den style presentation down again to the final three and, and we won that investment for, for Folkestone. Uh, but even more importantly, we're training a couple of the participants to become leaders themselves in, in the groups that, group sessions that we lead. So there's a, there's a qualification called Leadership in Running Fitness from British Athletics. It's only a day course. And it's quite a hard day, but it's an achievable day for some of the people that we've worked with. And they'll end up with a coaching licence. And the first girl that we work with, it's her very first qualification, her first certificate in anything. So she's walking about with a coaching licence. She's leading our sessions, so she's not a qualified British Athletics coach yet, but she's a qualified run leader. So as long as we're there, she can run. So quite often we get 20 people, and it's, it's too unwieldy for one or two coaches, so we'll break that up in, into four. So I'll take five, Steve will take five. And, and we can get run leaders who actually have lived it as well. And they are far more powerful than we are because they, can, although I've got a bit of that background as well, but the, this is more recent for the people that are going to be leading those sessions. They can say, stick with this, keep coming. Because six months ago, I was on the street. I was, I was drinking, that's Becky there. 
I mean, she's a lot thinner now than she was in that. You know the lady who said, I've, I've been sober for five months and I've lost two stone? Now she's, <laughs> she's, uh, so it's got to be, a, it's nearly a year that she's been sober and she's lost an incredible amount of weight. She's moved out of the homeless hostel. She was volunteering full time in Dover and to a point where the organisation said, well, we can't have you keep volunteering, we need to employ you. So she's got her own flat, she's, well, she's got a house share, she's sharing with a reputable maths teacher who's in recovery himself, so there's no alcohol in the house. Um, she's going to become a run leader herself, and she's got a job, and you know, I'm not saying that we're wholly responsible for that, because she had to take ownership, and again, that's what we encourage people to do. And it's about creating like a tribal atmosphere every week where everyone's accountable, if you're going to come back, say you're going to come back and to each other. If you can't make it, let us know now. But don't just not show up because sometimes they're allowed, it's, it's forgiven, it's forgiven for them not to show up and we don't forgive it. Um, we might forgive it once or twice, but there's a bit of tough love in there because we ought to give them an the opportunity to say, I'm not coming back next week. But if you commit to coming back, then you're committing to our our tribe and to live very in a no tribalism can be perceived as a as a dangerous thing but in the best possible way of, you know we're humans are pack animals like those horses are pack animals and once we've committed to each other that's really important that we keep that commitment and I think it's important what that guy said from Porchlight is that if they ch make one change in their life then it kind of leads on to other changes and the reason we're all here today is about veganism so Becky is now a vegan too. And so that first stage, right, so forget the gym. Thank you, thanks, but no thanks to the gym membership and to the GP. Come into the woods weekly or bi weekly with us. We'll make it free for you and we'll, we'll, we'll introduce veganism by the back door. You know, we'll, we'll bring the protein balls and we'll bring the, the vegan plant based diet. And then we make it clear. So yesterday, the corporate away day, uh, obviously, one of the questions they ask is, do you need to know the dietary requirements of our, of, of our staff team? And I was like, well, it doesn't matter because everything's vegan. So they're not going <laughs> to... Everyone's going to be able to eat everything. And my wife cooks all the, the dinners. And she, uh, she's been vegetarian for 16 years and vegan now for about four. So that's the journey, really, of Primal Roots. And, and you know, if any of you want to join in our sessions, you'd be more than welcome. We've got a... Pretty cool website we're proud of. Somebody gave us £10,000 to build a really swanky website. So we went up to a branding agency in London and we took the homeless people with us um, and we wanted to, to make sure it reflected, it reflected them and their journey. And so if you go to primalroots.co.uk you can see um, more about, about us and you can get in touch about our sessions. You won't be able to see exactly where we meet, so if you drop us a line, because we meet at different places, like literally when I say, if there's two trees there, we'll meet there, and then we will do that, but preferably we meet in beautiful forests. So the nearest one we meet in, to this area is Cloudswood, between here and Whitstable, which is the, uh, the big forest next to the university, managed by the Forestry Commission. And we've got, we have permission by the Forestry Commission to to do these activities. They charge us like 70 quid a year, which is reasonable. <laughs> and um, we we're about to start in Bedgebury Forest as well, which is in Tunbridge Wells. And you know, some of, the, some of the guys we've taken into the wood, you know, some of the guys we've met in, in Thanet. And we've just formed a relationship with an organisation in Brixton as well. <clears throat> and working with young people who've are in danger of falling into a gang or they might already be involved in gang activity and who've never, some of them never been out of Brixton, let alone to the seaside or to the forest. So, and some of our, some of our people need toughening up a bit. So we're, we're going to do like a, a, a cross, um, cross cultural maybe partnership where we take young people up to, up to Brixton and, and there's this amazing guy called uh, Stedman Scott who, who trains boxers and footballers uh, from these estates in Brixton. And he's got a disproportionate amount of young people into the Premier League. It's an incredible story. But it's called Afiwe, which is Brixton for this is us, this is ours. And so, yeah, we're really looking forward to that. And, and it's become a full-time job for me and Steve, that guy. And 
yeah, that's, that sums it up really. Quarter past eleven. That's not bad, is it? <laughs> cool. So, any questions? No. So, do you have a sort of particular diet, or do you like in terms of being diet? Or do you like stuff to be very? Well, just eat what you want to hold in. Yeah, my um, my wife calls him my man crush. <laughs> So I've got, he wrote a book called The Plant Power Way and so most of the recipes are from The Plant Power Way and it's, that's really because it's all about recovery from exercise or preparing yourself for exercise. So it's like blends, we do really simple blends, you know, just a, one trip every three months to the Whole Food Canterbury store to get all the, the maca or the wheat, you know, spirulina or whatever. And we make the blends, and and uh, and there's some great recipes that we use in this as well. In the winter, there's an amazing chili, like 15 bean chili that we that we knock up. Um, and do you know the happy pair? Happy pair, there's two Irish brothers. They've got some brilliant vegan recipes that you go on YouTube. There's like these exuberant twin brothers, and you can, they say five to ten minutes to knock up a, a meal, and it really is that. So we just have YouTube in, in the kitchen and we pour, pause it every 30 seconds and, and do that. But we get them involved in the cooking as well, which is really important because it kind of debunks the, the myth that it's like really expensive or takes, takes ages, which it, and it doesn't. And we've got veg donated to us. Uh, do you know Thanet Earth? They grow peppers, tomatoes and peppers, tomatoes and cucumbers. And shamefully, they, they have to, they don't throw it away because they actually give it away, which is really good of them. But the people they're supplying to, like Sainsbury's and Tesco, they won't accept it if it's too wonky or if there's a little blemish on the, on the pepper, which is great for us. You can make amazing pep, red pepper and tomato soups and you know, cucumbers coming out of their ears and stuff. But it's, uh, as many of those relationships we can form, the better. So... And the equine therapy thing is really good as well because those guys make the connection between what the horses are fueled on and their recovery too because sometimes a horse will come in if it's been rescued and it would have been abused sometimes as well as, as neglected and through what they put in its body it recovers quite quickly with the love that it's given as well. So. I think I've laboured that point, but there is a correlation between what we're doing with the what they're doing with the horses, and what we're doing to ourselves in recovery, and that's that's really important to us. But please do get in touch, and it'd be great to see you join us in the woods for for a workout. And it's for all, all levels, you know. We've had, as I say, people with a 20-year heroin addiction, only only been clean for three weeks, come in and. And, and do our sessions and Steve's the guy who's got the real background in, in personal training so the one-to-one -one sessions are really, really good. You know, and if you pretend to be homeless you get an 80 pound session for, <laughs> uh, for nothing. <laughs> cool. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers.